Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, we're going to get started. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Michael Glickman, and I have the pleasure and privilege of running the Center for Jewish History, and we're thrilled to be hosting this program this evening. It's always wonderful when we can introduce a new audience or a new group of friends to this institution, which exists as the world's largest repository of the modern Jewish experience. In this very building, we house and preserve and present over 100 million documents, 500,000 volumes, the largest Jewish genealogical center outside of the state of Israel, and a host of other programs and offerings that make connecting with the past and Jewish history very accessible. So it's quite nice to be able to join with you all as you're talking about how to revitalize some aspect of the past and also how to bring that to a new audience and a new community. As we strive to enrich the experience of many, I hope you will come back and explore this institution. In the coming weeks, we will open the new David Berg Rare Book Room, which will be a stunning showpiece of how rare books and collections can be presented to the public in unique and extraordinary ways. It will be a wonderful capstone for what has been a continued point of building within this institution and a very accessible space. So without further ado, I welcome Sarah Schur to introduce tonight's program. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good evening. My name is Sarah Schur, and I'm the Program Associate for Jewish Heritage at World Monuments Fund. Um, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation on the restoration of Zemosh uh, Renaissance Synagogue. I want to start by thanking the Center for Jewish History for generously allowing us to host this special lecture this evening, and also to thank the David Berg Foundation for originally developing the idea of hosting this special lecture somewhere grander than our office's conference room. Our World Monuments Fund is a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving the world's most treasured places. In 1988, we launched the Jewish Heritage Program as a special initiative of the organization, and since then we've worked on 50 Jewish heritage sites in 25 different countries throughout Europe, Asia, Africa, and South America. While our broadest mandate has always been preserving these sites through conservation work in collaboration with local partners, such as our work at Zamosh with uh, Monica's organization, we also aim to raise public awareness of and interest in the preservation of Jewish cultural heritage sites. One such project that we're excited to launch this evening is an interactive map of the Hasidic route. I'll just do this. With assistance from World Monuments Fund, the Foundation for the Preservation of Jewish Heritage in Poland developed this tourist journey that connects historic sites in various cities and towns throughout southeast Poland that were once centers of Hasidism. While there are brochures for the route, we wanted to make this experience more accessible and engaging so that people would feel encouraged to visit these sites or if unable to travel to Poland, enjoy it from the comfort of their home. So as you can see, the route begins with Zamosh Synagogue, uh, the topic of tonight's lecture. Um, and you can explore these sites either geographically or chronologically going forward or backwards in time. You can look at images of the sites, look at a narrative of the history, and then we've also mapped uh, Jewish population data in relationship to historical events in Poland, as well as the site's history, such as when it was built, restored, damaged, et cetera. Um, so we're very excited about this resource, um, and we'll be handing out um, brochures about this um, map uh, after the lecture. Um, World Monuments Fund also will uh, be doing more of these maps featuring Jewish heritage routes around the world. So now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Monica Krauchik. Ms. Krauchik is an attorney with an independent practice in Warsaw. Formerly working as an associate in a London law firm, her expertise is in real estate and property finance. Since 1999, Monica has been a member of the Governmental Regulatory Commission for Jewish Property Restitution, and since 2001, she has been a consultant of several international Jewish organizations dealing with restitution of Jewish properties. Monica became the CEO of the Foundation for the Preservation of Jewish Heritage in Poland in 2004. In 2009, Monica was awarded a Medal of Recognition by the President of Poland for outstanding work in the field of national heritage. She is also a speaker in many international forums on Jewish heritage in Poland and legal issues relating to the restitution and management of historical sites. Please welcome Monica Krauchik to the podium.
Thank you for this wonderful introduction. I was very impressed by myself hearing that. <laughs> um, I would like to thank very much uh, the World Monument Fund for bringing, bringing me here and giving this uh, wonderful opportunity to visit the cultural uh, center of the world, the capital of world culture, and so I'm so happy to be here in New York City. And uh, I would like to thank especially President of the World Monument Fund, uh, Bonnie Berham, and uh, Executive Vice President Lisa Ackerman, and Sarah Sher, who put it together for this uh, event. And uh, I also am ha I'm very happy to see among you um, many friends with whom we worked on some projects in Poland, or we corresponded, or we actually had some other um, communications. So uh, that the Polish subject somewhere rings the bell in uh, far away in America. And uh, I'm glad I could share uh, with you a few words about our work and what we do. Um, well, so let's start. Um, it's uh, the Foundation for Preservation of Jewish Heritage in Poland, and uh, actually the name describes well what's, uh, what's involved, what's, what's uh, happening. Historically, uh, this organization was put together in the result of uh, passing uh, in 1997 law uh, regulating status of Jewish communities in Poland, actually reconstituting them after uh, gaining uh, the democratic state uh, after fall of communism. And uh, among uh, uh, legislations uh, leading to democratization of Poland, there were also series of acts of law uh, dealing with uh, the status of religious communities, including the Jewish community in Poland. At that time, there were nine individual Jewish communities uh, uh, in, in our country, uh, which uh, were um, put together in a form of under umbrella organization, which is the, called the Union of Jewish Communities in Poland. And uh, also this law provided for opportunity to uh, return back to the Jewish community all properties that belong before the war to the, to the communities. So when uh, actually the union of the Jewish communities started to count those, uh, those uh, figures or the properties that were involved, it turned out that there is a large number uh, of, of properties that are, um, that are um, of historical significance. And something had to be done to uh, think from the, in, from, from the initial perspective on how to deal with those historical sites which may become the, the property of Jewish uh, organizations in Poland. And uh, also we know that most of Polish Jews do not live in Poland any longer, or at that time of course they were not living in Poland, but they felt connected. Uh, so the World Jewish Restitution Organization which was representing them uh, decided to join forces with the Polish uh, uh, communities in Statunascendi uh, and, and created the um, specialized organization, the Foundation for Preservation of Jewish Heritage in Poland, to deal with the historical sites. Um, and our mission is to protect the surviving uh, monuments that are important for our history but we believe that uh, it's also part of uh, Polish uh, cultural heritage, uh, even though most Polish people don't think that the Jewish cemetery is part of our national uh, heritage. Um, but we try, of course, by some educational activities um, also uh, change this um, view. And uh, here we come in Poland with 1,200 Jewish cemeteries and about 600 historical synagogues and other places of historical interest. And you can see that and compare it in the statistics that we have nine Jewish communities with total members of about 4,000 people. So you can see the magnitude of, uh, the, of, the, of the burden, I would say, of Jewish history in Poland that, was, uh, that encompassed uh, 900 years 
uh, developed in such a beautiful way to create 1,200 uh, major centers of Jewish life because this were the, uh, the, the, um, the headquarters of the communities of the Kahau, as they called it, in the uh, centuries before. Um, and uh, now we think it's a major, her major heritage that we owe also to the past, the recognition of those sites as a memorial and as a sign for us to remember. And that's why they are important. Uh, of course, there are some views that, well, you can, we don't care for the old buildings or old, uh, old sites uh, if we don't, uh, if we cannot use it uh, in, in the way that is uh, generating profit. But uh, actually the work uh, also of the World Monument Fund is testifying that uh, those uh, uh, products of human activity and culture, they are, they are unique and saving every single one of the single one object that, uh, we, uh, that we could save, we are saving like the whole world. I'm paraphrasing the Talmud here. <laughs> Um, here is Poland, uh, located in the, in the center of Europe. Um, its borders shifted, of course, after Second World War, and uh, our foundation is not dealing with the, um, with the heritage sites that, are, uh, that were historically Polish, or located in historical Poland, but now they are in Ukraine, Belarus, uh, and Lithuania. Uh, but on the other hand, we are dealing, and we have to, because it's now Poland, uh, with, the, with the sites that are located in the former German territories. So surprisingly, we not only have to deal with this magnitude of Polish history, but also of the history of German Jews of East Prussia, which happened to be in the borders uh, of, uh, of today. And as you see, this uh, shape of Poland today, it's, and it also in the past, it's always looked like a heart. So um, I'm sure that uh, uh, in many, many hearts of many people, Poland has this little corner, and that's why it's uh, always so appealing. Um, as Poland has some sort of symbolic meaning also as a... Um, as a symbol of, of this uh, beautiful culture and uh, development of Jewish history in Europe. Um, I think that we were very privileged to, to, to have this um, um, history connected with, with our country. And of course, the Second World War changed and ruined this whole beautiful world, uh, left it with ashes. But uh, so today the situation is that uh, most of uh, um, uh, Ashkenazi Jews who live outside fr from Poland, somewhere in the world, in the diaspora, it is estimated that 65% actually can trace down their roots in Poland. So again, you see that Poland is somewhere always appearing and. Uh, and somehow present in our lives, or lives in many people. Of course, we have also in America, we have also huge Polish diaspora. But, uh, I don't dare to ask who has Polish roots here, but <laughs> since we are in the Sfaradi Federation building also. So <laughs> but actually, it's also very interesting that uh, to which we come back later, that Zamość Synagogue was actually built for the Sfaradi Jews who came to Poland, who were brought to Poland by one of the uh, nobles that set up the Zamość city. Now, this is a picture of, uh, um, of the uh, Zamość Synagogue. You can see on, uh, uh, this is before renovation and this is after it doesn't from the just from looking from the picture it doesn't really represent the real condition so let me describe it uh, the foundation became owner of this building in 2001 
and it was one of the first buildings that the government returned to the, to the Jewish community. And uh, it housed the library that was a mini uh, city library for public use. Um, most of the buildings that, uh, that we receive, uh, historical like that, uh, they are in very bad technical condition. Of course, they may have been listed as a national heritage site uh, and officially protected, but it didn't mean that after the war the government would actually pay attention to those sites. So we would say that in majesty of the, of the law, the, those uh, historical places were uh, falling into, into disrepair. This uh, library I uh, visited in some, some years later uh, when I became uh, responsible for this work and it was very surprising to see that actually uh, the um, it was raining actually at that time when we visited and they had uh, just buckets for the water dripping from the roof put on the tables in the reading hall. <laughs> so it was uh, this, uh, this type of uh, this, this uh, condition. Then when the roof was actually almost falling inside, the city decided to move the library and uh, basically they left us with this uh, building uh, with something had to be done and we started this uh, big process of uh, thinking what can be done there and uh, what uh, actually how can we finance this whole uh, enterprise because this was like uh, beyond our imagination that we actually can get to this very result. Um, now, Zamość as a, as a city is very interesting because it was based, uh, because it was built in one piece in 16th century, and it was based on the idea of um, the Italian Cita Ideale, based on the, on the philosophy of uh, humanism that was uh, the Renaissance uh, um, leading thought. And uh, I'll show you the, another slide there where you can understand more what was the city ideale. It was the place which is, first of all, which has, uh, which has uh, an architectural order and streets set with houses in rows. Uh, but what was also most important that it was based also on some sort of idea, the idea of tolerance and balance. And this balance and tolerance was uh, secured by having in the corners of the, uh, of the, of the town, the synagogue became, was built later on, it was here, in the, in the corners of the, of the town to have the temples of four religions that were actually major religions at the time, Catholic Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, Armenian Church, and the synagogue. So it was based from the beginning on this very idea of tolerance, which is our ideal today, but we cannot somehow achieve it. And mostly in, the, in, in so you can see the picture here, uh, contemporary picture, and uh, where we have the, um, the more or less the same shape. Of course, there is more buildings and so on, but, but this is the same shape. Um, Going back, because uh, it's also important, the city as, uh, of Zamość as a whole was registered as the UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1992. And the number of citizens, it shows you it's not the smallest place on earth. So there is some life of a general of some city. Um, now, Zamość was also uh, located as a at the same time when we were thinking what to do with Zamość and how to renovate it, we were also thinking on, in more complex way how to actually approach this problem of renovation and bringing uh, attention to those historical sites to broader public, both Polish and Jewish tourism or foreign tourism. Um, and we came up with the idea of uh, creating the Hasidic route. Now, again, it's just the name uh, that is connecting um, right now 27 towns. 
uh, out of which 26 are really connected with the Hasidic uh, history of some presence of, uh, of this movement and uh, strong, uh, I would say, cult of the tzaddikim, the Hasidic leaders that are buried in those sites, uh, except for one town that had almost no Hasidic history. Would you try to guess what city it was? <laughs> uh, let's see this map here. Okay. Well, this Sarah presented much better map, I'm sorry. But would you guess which city was not? It was Zamość, <laughs> which was, which was uh, uh, always uh, considered a harbor and uh, hammer on all Hasidic uh, communities living nearby. Uh, why it was like this? We don't know exactly, but some historian says that because of this Faradi uh, heritage that this uh, community always had, they were not really much following this uh, Eastern, uh, trad Eastern uh, meaning the Ukrainian traditions or, or then further Polish traditions of, of Hasidic history. So then we thought, well, it's a good place for the center. And then the names also, the name has Hasidic, it rings the bell in Polish uh, um, contemporary culture or contemporary narrative of, uh, of uh, Jewish history in Poland. So, uh, so that's the, that's how it, how it came into existence. And it connects, uh, the sites uh, that are that are located in those only two um, provinces in Poland. It's a big country to, if you wish to uh, drive along this road and to see all these places, it would take three days. And of course, I invite everybody to come and visit. Um, but the, the synagogue, after renovation, we thought it will become like a center with full information set and, uh, and it will somehow radiate onto the other towns and, uh, and also maybe set an example that we could actually uh, use the same idea of a road and put it in another uh, parts of Poland. Like, it's my big idea to create a, a road of uh, German Jews in Poland, or the Silesian Jews. And uh, that's uh, for future, so we have uh, some other time. And uh, coming back what we did with the synagogue, uh, it took four years to raise funds, and uh, this uh, was actually possible to start thinking of it, because Poland is uh, member of European Union, and as an underdeveloped country, it uh, received the participation in the, in the financial help project that is uh, actually funding, uh, that, could find, that, that can finance 85% of the cost of the total, uh, total cost of the project. And so we were concerned about this 15%. Now, when you talk about percentages, then it turns out that uh, uh, if, if the number is 10, then the, this, this uh, amount would be much smaller. But if we are talking about projects that are worth a few million zlotys or euro or dollars, then the percentage is becoming significant. And we were thinking that this will be actually non possible for us to somehow generate the, this, uh, this fi only 15%. So we prepared all the full uh, re renovation documentation, architectural documentation. Uh, the, um, we worked with the art historian, conservation uh, people who were, who were specialists and experts on that subjects. And uh, we also applied to the Polish Ministry of Culture, which uh, had a special program to actually help the Polish owners of historical sites to finance this 15% um, portion that was required to use this big money from the European Union Fund. But the Polish Ministry of Col uh, Culture actually refused to, um, to support this project. Um, which uh, 
caused uh, us, uh, another delay in implementing the uh, actual renovation uh, because we had to wait for the funds. Um, but in the end, it, uh, it, it resulted in a, in a positive uh, way. I will say, I will uh, come back to that. But um, it's also uh, here I, I wrote it down specially to bring attention to one element that is, uh, that is apparent in this um, sort of uh, situations when we receive a property back, historical property from the government. It's usually the expectation is that the Jewish community will immediately renovate it, state of art. And then you know, I could say, hello, <laughs> but it took you 70 years to ruin this building. <laughs> so g give us at least five years or six years. <laughs> and uh, so that's also some sort of a, a social aspect that we are dealing with and where we need uh, to educate the public about, uh, about the reality. And because, of course, the presumption is that the Jews, of course, are rich and stereo in a stereotype way that, uh, of course, it's a matter of uh, some charm. And just, uh, so um, that uh, was the end result of our financial uh, cost of this project. As you see, the, the first biggest amount is the European Union Fund. Then we had a great cooperation with the Rothschild Foundation. Uh, our foundation came up also with the money that the board decided to allocate for this project. World Monument Fund uh, was tremendously helpful, um, and uh, which, for which we are also very grateful because it, it, World Monument Fund is known for their big projects on the huge uh, scale or dealing with the most precious uh, objects on earth. So when uh, some governmental people heard that this is also World Monument Fund involved, they they had the double <laughs> they doubled the, their interest, and Kahneman Foundation with with uh, additional grants. So altogether, the value of this renovation was over two million U.S. dollars. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. And that's the last, the pictures that are showing. Uh, again, the, um, the renovated synagogue. And here is the interior. Again, this is the how it was. And this is how it is. And this uh, place is uh, used for cultural center and events. Uh, it's open for, for tourist uh, visits. It's also open for Jewish activities, but so far nobody wanted to come and have bar mitzvah there, if, if you know anybody. <laughs> Welcome. Um, it's a few pictures from the, this is a picture from uh, opening of the, of the synagogue. It was a big event. Um, a conference on Jewish on, on on history and culture. We have cooperation with uh, two universities in the area, so we also try to promote some Jewish studies approach. Um, modern art exhibition, uh, some lectures, other events. Uh, now the the result also of our fight for money was uh, was uh, such that accidentally uh, we generated some savings on the which which resulted from the exchange rate differences with the european union money because this was euro that we paid in zlotys and and uh, actually the economic global economic crisis struck in the middle of the of when the grants were approved according to the uh, to the cost estimates from before recession. <laughs> and then we actually could not find uh, companies that would bid for uh, this so high amounts of money. So we had to give them additional projects to do. 
and we decided to actually help uh, another town and another synagogues in our Hasidic route in, in Krasnik. Um, that's only external part was renovated, um, but it's important and significant also for the whole our projects. And we have new challenge, but before we go to the new challenge, I would like to uh, stay on this picture and uh, ask um, publicly myself and, and also you, uh, was it worth it? Because when I think about $2 million, it's, it's really a huge amount. And of course, we can think of many other needs in education, in healthcare, in, in helping uh, disadvantaged people uh, in many other ways. But was it worth to put so much money in this uh, synagogue in Poland? And the answer is uh, yes. I hope you're not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> We saved, uh, first of all, there's uh, several reasons. Uh, we saved uh, the prime histo historical heritage site. We returned it to the Jewish context. Before it, were, there was, it was a library. Nobody was thinking about this place as a synagogue, as, a, as some historical presence of, of this uh, special minority. Um, we have uh, also created a tool in encouraging uh, Jewish and non-Jewish non tourism, and which is important from, to promote uh, um, the, the, this Jewish material culture as part of national heritage. We created a tool for uh, education and also like implemented, built in uh, educational value into the, this place. Um, we are promoting by restoring the dignity of this place where people prayed for many centuries. Also, we are promo promoting co coexistence and tolerance. We are opening this space to people that they should come. Everybody is welcomed to see what was this uh, um, input that the Jewish people had in Poland as a part of minority and uh, but uh, which contributed tremendously uh, in Polish culture throughout the years. And uh, we also built a platform of communication and cooperation for broader culture. Um, getting back to our new challenge, this is synagogue in Przysucha. I know it's unpronounceable. <laughs> So let's, let's call it Repsim Habunem, <laughs> Shul or Synagogue. Uh, it's actually, this building is, uh, doesn't look from the outside anything comparing to Zamość, but it's three times bigger than, than Zamość Synagogue. It has, uh, it has probably more rich uh, uh, interiors. It's, you see some fragments that were um, actually uh, preserved for future uh, discovery, what it's actually look like those uh, those uh, um, sculpture on uh, on the walls. Um, we are right now in some stage of um, of uh, um, re re renovating the roof, for which we had also. Uh, some financial help from other international um, foundations. And we hope that this place will also become uh, the same, maybe state of art uh, place that is showing the formal, former glory of, uh, of the uh, Jews in the past. And uh, I can only invite you for cooperation and being interested and visiting our website. And if anybody would like to be in, in contact, please let us know. And uh, that's uh, it as it comes for this presentation. I hope it was not too boring. I noticed few people sleeping, but <laughs> maybe they were deep in their thoughts.
Thank you, Monica. Um, we do have some time for some questions and answers. There's going to be two mics. Um, so if anybody has any questions for Monica. There is always a worry that there will be no questions. All right, okay. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank you. Welcome to New York. Um, I would say that when I planned my trip to Poland uh, three years ago, part of uh, the resources I used was the uh, Hasidic Trail. So I've been to many of these places, but uh, when I went to Zamosh, the synagogue was not open to the public because mm -hmm. it was undergoing restoration as the town hall as well. But I wanted to ask you about another um, synagogue on the Hasidic Trail. Um, I um, went to Poland to um, and spent a long time, a, a month traveling and looking at various synagogues and buildings. But I also attended the um, commemorative event at the Rimanov Synagogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, being that you're in New York and um, learning that it was sold by your organization to um, congregate or a Hasidic congregation in Brooklyn. Um, my concern, uh, having met numerous people, and I had a great uncle who lived in Rimanov before the war and his family, um, and I know how important it was to put the roof on that building. I know it was one of the first projects that you were involved with. Mm -hmm. Um, but having been there and seen it and knowing that there's uh, a lot of work that needs to be done to um, maintain the building, that, and um, I, one of my, my first question has to do with even this synagogue. What uh, is, has been done to prepare for future maintenance of the building in Zamosh? And as regarding the synagogue in Rimanov, being that you don't own it anymore and it's privately owned by someone I, gather does not have the funds to um, continue to keep the building uh, in a sound condition, what do you recommend for um, it, to try to conserve that building as well and, uh, and other synagogues in the, along the Hasidic Trail? Okay, great question. Thank you very much. And I suggest uh, that the World Monument Fund organizes another lecture only on that, <laughs> how to maintain. <laughs> but uh, in a nutshell, um, the Zamoy Synagogue has, uh, uh, is um, based on this um, European Union project, which actually also asked this question, that uh, it's not enough to just put money into the restoration of the walls, but you also have to have some sustainability of this project. So we had to come up with the whole plan, which is like a book, uh, describing our activities and what, uh, what, how to generate necessary uh, structure for maintaining it. And from financial side, it has some uh, reserve that, that was created from this uh, initial fund to make sure that there is uh, money to pay for the electricity, heating, and uh, three people actually have to be employed there. So that's the, this is the structure that we, that we uh, implemented. And it's also some, serves as a know-how for other sites if we, uh, if we wanted to, Im to repeat these projects in other sites where there are historical synagogues. The only project problem is that is this 15% that we are always struggling with. And, uh, and also there is some other port, parts of money that has to go be paid before, uh, before the, the project can be actually, the application could be actually placed with the committee that is deciding on those grants. So, uh, so that's the big struggle. And with, uh, other, uh, other synagogues, I, I just would say that, uh, every place has its own dynamics. And in every place, uh, we are, have to, uh, use the resources that are actually available at hand. Because in some places, uh, we will not be able, uh, ever to provide 100%, uh, effective uh, rebuilding and operating of those places. So we will always have places like in Rimanov, which, which is used occasionally by the, uh, by the groups of visitors that are coming maybe once or twice or three times a year, but they are using it. And uh, we are glad that this uh, 
uh, building actually gained roof through the uh, effort of private people. So at least it will stand uh, longer than than maybe without uh, without a roof. Can, can you tell us when the construction began on the Zamosh synagogue and when it ended? And also whether uh, any of the people who worked on it, were they from Zamosh or were they from other areas of Poland? And the, I assume that the work was overseen by presumably your organization or the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the monument fund. Uh, we uh, were... We started to to deal with the with the with this project, putting up together documentation in 2007, and uh, we finished the the, the full the construction and uh, and renovation in uh, 2011. So this is the time span. Uh, we of course we had the construction company qualified and so on. They were uh, from Lublin, which is uh, actually one hour drive. It's a, a province city. And uh, it happened that actually they won the tender, but we also had the competing uh, companies from Poznań and from other parts of Poland. And uh, specialists in this uh, uh, heritage or historical um, sites protection, they come from all over Poland. The um, man who was doing the renovation of uh, uh, of some paintings, uh, he came from actually from Gdańsk. So it's, uh, we are using all kinds of people that are available and qualified. I just want to follow up. You said the the permits were uh, started to be obtained in 2007. I wanted to know when the actual construction began. I know it was completed in 2011. Was construction started in 2008? Um, I don't. I don't remember. And uh, I can tell you that uh, when I started to work in this foundation in 2004, and today it's almost 10 years, and I cannot believe that I spent quarter of my life on <laughs> on cemeteries. You know. <laughs> But uh, but I will be glad to provide you with very detail all the details. I'll, you can contact me, and I will send you exactly the date when we signed the releasing of the construction site to the company, and uh, when we get the permit for use. I see. Here also, a gentleman who wants to ask question and. Uh, thank you, um, and welcome. I just had one question. You had mentioned, and I, I believe it was the Polish Ministry of Culture, mm -hmm. is that the name? That they uh, had refused to support the project. I was curious uh, if they had history with supporting other Jewish heritage sites in Poland, and I don't know what your thoughts were on that. For that, I would uh, invite you to, to attend my lecture in the uh, Wiesenthal Center for, for <laughs> Museum of Tolerance next Monday, because I have a slide on that. But basically, um, it's, uh, it's very interesting that uh, Polish Ministry of Culture is allocated every year some, some budget for the uh, renovation of the, uh, of the historical registered sites. Uh, surprisingly, almost 99% uh, of the grants are won uh, by the uh, dominating uh, religion in Poland for renovation of the historical churches and other places. So uh, we, I would say that we are, would very much appreciate more cooperation with, uh, with uh, Polish Ministry of Culture as uh, recognition of this uh, huge uh, value of, uh, of, um, of Jewish culture, that material culture that is present in Poland, and we will not escape from it. Thank you. There's a question there, I see. And uh, My question is, are any of the sites, if you, if you rebuild these magnificent buildings, does it encourage a, a community to form again? 
I wish, but uh, but you know, in Poland there is uh, hardly minyan the the prayer forum in those nine <laughs> nine communities. So uh, we are talking about a town that is uh, that the that I know there is one Jew, but he doesn't want to <laughs> to admit. So, <laughs> but he comes he comes very often to to the synagogue just to check if if it stands and if everything is in order. So. Unfortunately, we don't have these chances, and we would love to. Uh, My question I see questions also in the end. Mm -hmm. I am interested in the relationship between your organization and what it does and the Polish population at large. I know that I grew up in Hara. In where? In Hara, mm -hmm. hearing about what happened to the Jews even after the war was over that return. But I have the impression that a new younger generation may feel some responsibility for the past and they have feelings. Can you talk about that? Um, of course. Um, the situation is that uh, this, uh, this observation is absolutely true, that uh, we have a generation of young people in Poland that are very interested in the in the past, in uh, actually in 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 the Jewish uh, story, in the story of uh, Roma community, uh, Lemko community, uh, all minorities which suddenly disappeared uh, after the war. And uh, when I was growing up, I had no idea that we had any any minorities uh, in Poland at all. And in a large way, it's a very monogenic society. We don't even have any immigration uh, in significant numbers. So, uh, so um, of course, the young generation is very interested in, in trying to rediscover this, um, these matters. We used to have a project that was called To Bring Memory Back, designed for high school students uh, who would like to learn about their local history in their own towns. And we had uh, really great results. It was uh, in the apogeum of this uh, project. We have one year. Had one year we had 230 schools participating from all over Poland. But now again, see what is the, is the proportion between this 1,200 sites that we know they exist, at least as a symbolic number of cemeteries and the schools that were willing to, to participate. And, uh, and the results of, the, of these activities were really tremendous. They, they created exhibitions, they even published a brochure, uh, they made lectures, they read literature, um, they were following some events, uh, they were interested in Israel. Um, so we had very, very good results, but now again we come back to the input of, the, of this financial side, that we could never get actually full uh, or the necessary amount from the public funds for education. Uh, so we had to suspend this project, and the last one we had uh, in 2011. And uh, now we are waiting for the mercy or, or changing the, uh, um, the, uh, the, 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 the view of, uh, of Polish Ministry of Education or other publicly available money for alternative uh, or supplementary education program that they, we could actually use those funds as well. Um, so, in a nutshell, it's another subject for a big lecture. Uh, any other questions? I see there is hand also. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you very much. Dziękuję. Uh, how did the synagogue survive the war? Why was it not destroyed? Do you have history on that? Uh, yes, yes we have. Uh, it was not really very surprisingly um, why it survived. Uh, it was just needed as a storage house warehouse. Uh, you know, Germans were very practical. They didn't uh, demolish uh, after, after they actually obtained the possession of the uh, and occupied the um, towns. 
uh, of course, we have pictures, uh, images from the Kristallnacht and burning synagogues. Some synagogues were burned also in Poland in 1939 when, uh, when the German army was advancing and they had this bad habit from their country to burn synagogues on the way. But if, if they didn't do it, uh, then it's, in most cases they actually su survived the war and then most of the uh, destruction or deterioration in technical condition was uh, a matter of actually the years after the war. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again, everyone, for being here. Thank you to Monica for a great <laughs>